company is just too big. You know, conflict of interest then comes. So when you see a share buyback in a situation like that, you, no one is thinking really okay about the broad uh, shareholder base. It's more a short-term thing that, that is supposed to achieve short-term gains. You know, the transactions that then take place, hence the very <coughs> silent cautionaries, because they benefit you know, those who are inside. You know, and the nature of the transactions again, you know, and, and when these things go wrong, and we've seen it time and again, it's the same things that keep happening. And I'm saying to myself that as shareholders, are we that blind or that dumb not to see that these things is killing us? You then get, you know, the over effect is what we're seeing now, you know, a poor performing stock market. Because the companies that are there are being run into the ground. And we are, we've got a front row seat, VIP seats, and we're watching this happen. And we're not doing anything about it. So really for me, like I said at the beginning, I'm here to learn. And I'm hoping that um, what is being said uh, by our guest speakers will really um, ignite something in you that as much as we might blame electricity shortages or liquidity and all sorts of things, unemployment, by us not doing anything as shareholders, we are just fueling that. We are just making it worse. And, I will and, and I'm here to say that we are here to assist you. Our ministry is very, in our new minister wants things to move forward. He is willing to hear what is wrong. We've said that we've got a very old companies act. Maybe that's part of the problem, that um, these dominant owner managers take advantage of that, that arbitrage that's there. And maybe also the fault is with us as the Securities Commission, and maybe the, as the stock exchange, that our listing rules, which are being redrafted now, are taking perhaps too long. You know, our own market conduct rules are still to be drafted and gazetted. So maybe those are some of the things that we can take blame for. But I think that it's a small part of the problem. The bigger part, in my view, rests with the shareholders. And I'm, I would like, after this conference, at least to see some change. You know. And I'm seeing also the press here. You know. um, it's something that also must happen there, that, that we must also publicize bad behavior when it happens. But we are all complicit in this. And so collectively, I think we get a capital markets that we deserve. Thank you. Um, thanks for the brilliant presentations for all, from all three presenters. Um, my name is Eve Gazikwa. I'm asking a question to the first presenter, Ms. Fiona Reynolds. Um, from your presentation, I picked up that PRI is engaging companies on issues to do with uh, ESG and also promoting disclosure. Um, but in the case of Zimbabwe, I just want to stress that we are playing a catch-up uh, game. Given that uh, we do have weak institutional frameworks, which Mr. Chinama has already made uh, reference to, as well as uh, multiple policy frameworks, we're also discussing issues to do with GRI, uh, uh, listing rules, uh, you know, still work in progress. Uh, we do have a national code uh, of co corporate governance which is yet to be launched and also old, um, uh, you know, archaic laws like the Companies Act. What is your uh, recommendation to us? Because clearly we are still quite a way behind in terms of getting to where we are supposed to be. That's a question for you. And then I also have a question for Mr. Tolisa uh, Tamini. How does the PRI interface with the GRI? Because it seems like there is some, um, you know, cross pollination of ideas between the two. Are you guys talking to each other? And if so, um, how can Zimbabwe take advantage of these two uh, various platforms? Thank you. Um, I was actually struck by something that uh, the last speaker had said, which was that we get the capital markets that we deserve. And I think that's not just true uh, for this country, I think that's true around the world. So in terms of the fact that Zimbabwe is behind other countries, yes, but you're, sta but you're starting. And I think the main thing is that you have to keep, you have to keep putting things in place. And I think the institutional investors in particular need to be really pushing companies, um, need to be pushing governments, need to be pushing the exchanges and the regulators as well. 
because it all needs to come together. You need the right regulations, the right codes um, uh, in place. The institutional investors can't just do it on their own. And I, th and I think um, you need to get the message out as well about what you're doing as a country and the steps that you're taking to address things. And I think, uh, I think investors will reward that if they can see that there's progress being made in the country. I think that um, institutional investors around the world will pay attention, but they want to see action. They want to see that it's not just about people talking about th things happening, that there is a, a timetable for progress. So I think it's just keep going. You're doing, you know what you have to do. You, you started down the right path and now you have to make sure that you actually get, that you get there. Um, just a cursory glance at these six principles, they seem to relate to investors, pension funds, asset managers and so forth, what they should expect from the companies. I represent such a company. I mean, what can the companies do, because you don't seem to target the companies specifically, what can the companies do to be already on the way into sustainable investments and so forth, so that their practices are more long term, as, as Mr. Shinamo had already said so that the companies themselves are already looking at the environment, the investments, um, all these sustainability issues. They just seem to relate to investors. What you want the investors to ask the companies, but there's nothing that says the companies should already be doing ABC. Also, Joanna, the PRI. And the second one is a general <coughs> comment on um, Mr. Chinamo's presentation. Um, my opinion is that um, the issue of shareholder apathy goes way beyond the shareholders, for instance, the institutional shareholders themselves. It goes right down to the stakeholders. For instance, if it's um, pension funds, the people that Ms. Reynolds uh, mentioned that are contributing to those pension funds, the workers, it is up to them to take an interest, an active interest in what is happening, how their money is being invested, so that they are assured of the benefit when they do eventually retire. So if they can then form um, uh, um, collaborations with um, other people in similar circumstances, for instance, they form pressure groups, such that they then force the pension funds to align, to realign their interests with the, 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 the employees who are contributing to those pension funds. Because what you find is that most of these institutional shareholders are approached by management of companies and they tend to align their interests more with the uh, companies rather than with the, the, the stakeholders, that is the employees who are contributing to those pension funds. So if those pressure groups are formed, then they can then force the pension funds to then realign and take an active interest in what is happening with the company in which they invest. We'll take one more question and then we'll have so on that issue of disclosure, one of the things that um, obviously different countries in the world, around the world have got um, different levels of regulation. So in some countries, you know, you do have to provide the ESG information in the reports that you're filing. But one of the um, things that we're working on is the, that we talked about briefly was the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative. So with that, we're working with exchanges around the world. We just had the London Stock Exchange join us a couple of weeks ago. And that is about them working with companies and the companies that list on their exchanges to provide ESG information and in <coughs> what form it would be provided so that in institutional investors can have the have the information that they need from companies. So we think working with the at the exchange level is is one way, but also working with um, um, with regulate with regulators in each country is is uh, another way. So that's one thing that we're doing there. With the disclosure that we actually collect from the PRI, that's about what the what our signatories are doing. So that's not about that's about what engagement they're taking with companies and how they're, in, how they're putting the principles into place and how they're integrating it across all the asset classes. And I think institutional investors, like everybody else, don't necessarily like reporting. They prefer, you know, some of them I think would prefer if they didn't have to report. But obviously, if we, are, if we as institutional investors are asking companies to do things and to disclose information, 
we have to be transparent as well about what actions that we're taking and showing that we are actually um, you know, contributing to the things that we say that we're, that we're doing. We have to be able to demonstrate it. So I think it's really important along the whole value chain that everybody is very um, clear about what they're doing. And I think transparency is the key to everything. Uh, it's about um, demonstrating that you're doing what you're saying that you're doing. So it needs to be at a number of levels. On the question that you asked about the companies, well, we were, yes, we very much work at the institutional investor level. So we're not working at the company level. We're, we, we're putting in place a whole lot of things for institutions to talk to companies. And we think by doing that, that that is how you get change from companies. So in our engagements, for example, um, our, our investors will talk to companies about, well, what what are what do you have in place for your employees? How are they how are they uh, paid? Is there freedom of association? Um, are workers treated are treated properly? We use some of the human rights um, conventions, for example, an engagement that we're doing at the moment on um, employees in the in the extractive <coughs> sector. We ask about um, what environmental practices are in place and that obviously that depends on the particular industries that the companies are in there'll be different questions that we ask we'll also they'll also ask about um, the governance of the organization about how about how directors are nominated about um, separation between the chair and the C CEO position so I suppose we're not really yeah we're we're empowering trying to empower the investors to um, make change within within the companies by asking the right questions and demanding the right things. That then brings the improvements to the companies. Thank Can you. pension funds join the PRI? Pressure groups. Oh, okay. I didn't hear the part. With pressure groups. <laughs> Well, really, again, we're about institutional investors, but we do work with a number of NGOs and pressure groups. So, one of the uh, there there are a number of pressure groups around that you know that are working to try to get um, pension fund members to actually uh, lobby their their pension funds to bring about change. And some of them are starting to have quite a big uh, a bit of effect. It's only small, but I think it will grow over time. So while they're not members as such, we do actively work with them and are happy to do so. Thank you. Black was the chairman of the, of the exchanges here, so I'm sure she can, I don't know, you, you... You've had various presentations from various speakers. And just one observation in terms of what has been said is that you mustn't think that when you do get a code for good corporate governance, or you do get a code for responsible investment, that that's going to be the alpha and the omega. And that'll be the end of the discussion. Because then the process actually really starts. So what is important? My topic today is about can good governance principles help Zimbabwe investors hold companies to account? And there are two issues which I'd like to address here. And the first one would be um, the issue of who, who should actually drive the process? Your asset owners and your asset managers are critical stakeholders in this uh, process. What I find in the South African context is that your asset owners and asset managers are very much driven by profit. Your asset manager is driven by profit on a quarterly basis, on a six monthly basis and a 12 monthly basis. If he doesn't derive returns for his investors, then the investors won't invest with him. So when it comes to social, environmental and governance issues, well, it's sort of a secondary thing. Yes, it is becoming more and more important, but it's a process that actually is going to take time. And therefore, um, your asset owners and asset managers need to actually start doing a lot more. The other issue which is important, which I feel, is that the Zimbabwe stock exchange is becoming the vogue, which is absolutely fantastic news for this country, that suddenly your investors are starting to look at, this, at, at the stock exchange and they're starting to look at investments in this country and they're saying to themselves, hang on, after weighing up the risks, this is a good country to actually invest in. But, but your government must also play a role 
in terms of this, this important event which is happening in your country. So on the one side you have your listed companies and on the other side you have the government. And on the listed, listed, listed companies, they're there to provide profits to their shareholders first and foremost, but they're also there to actually provide and create employment, which is critical. Once they start deriving more profits, that money channels into the government. And the government, also being a big stakeholder in this process, is there to assist with bigger projects within the economy. Sorry about that. So in terms of setting the scene, and I think this is very important, and it's important for all players. It's important for listed companies. It's important for government. It's important for asset owners and asset managers that you analyze who your stakeholders are. Because you need to know who you are dealing with. If you look at, let's say, stakeholders in a listed uh, sense, your biggest stakeholder will be your shareholders, and those are your asset owners and asset managers. You've got NGOs. In South Africa, we have got Benchmarks, which is an NGO which plays in the mining sector, and they do actually invaluable work in holding mining companies to account. They do research. They do research on environmental issues. They do research in community issues. One thing they don't do is they don't really get into the AGM space, and that's something which I would like them to start doing by taking their research and not just you know, putting it out as a media press clipping, but actually then engaging with companies in, in the AGM space. You've got, you've got regulatory bodies, Security and Exchange Commission of Zimbabwe, we've got the government, we've got the press. Press, never underestimate the role that the press play. Press is a critical role in every society. As I said to you at the last conference, when I attend AGMs, um, the company have the company secretaries, and I, my company secretaries are the press. Because what they do is they portray what I have asked in those meetings. They take those questions, and they put those questions out in print media or on the web, and that stimulates the debate. And that raises the issue of transparency. And by doing that, ladies and gentlemen, what we are doing is we're getting companies to be more accountable. So in the South African context, what do we have in terms of processes that, we, that shareholders can use to hold companies to account? Well, we've got a New Companies Act, we've got an Income Tax Act, we've got National Environmental Management by the Biodiversity Act, we've got the JSC Rules and Regulations, we've got the King Code of Corporate Governance, and we've gone through a process of the King Code. We've got King 1, King 2, and King 3. So it's not as if once you get a code, then that's the end of it. The code is, is a journey, and it's actually quite a long journey in terms of that what you have to walk. walk. And then we've got the code for responsible investment, and, and we've put that in place mainly to, to ensure that the asset owners and asset managers hold the companies to account in terms of the JSC rules and regulations. They hold companies to account in terms of how they invest. And we've also heard from various other speakers about how asset owners and asset managers should collaborate together in, in, in holding companies to account. Well, now let's get down to the nitty gritty, and that is actually sort of what I do best. And what I do best is I'm able to give you actual examples of companies that I've taken on in terms of at AGMs, in terms of what I feel, you know, not good disclosure. Now, in the Safin context, I mean, everybody knows about Standard Bank, and uh, it's, a, it's quite a big bank, and it's actually done tremendous expansion into Africa. It's probably one of the most successful companies in, expansion, in expanding into Africa. They have now just appointed uh, two CEOs, whereas previously they had one CEO. And the issues we raised here, ladies and gentlemen, was the remuneration that was paid. Not so much the remuneration, but it was actually the bonuses that were paid to these executive directors. And the transparency that goes. I'm not against CEOs or CFOs shooting the lights out in terms of their bonus. What I am against is the fact that they don't give us enough information for me to make a judgment call to say that this nine million which the CEO got is fair and reasonable. And that's a process that that needs to be put in place. Uh, what I mean when we when I engage with Standard Bank, um, the normal process is the chairman of the Remco would phone me, Ted Woods, and we would meet prior to the AGM and we would go through the issues. 
I think I've met Ted now probably three or four times um, in terms of it. And quite honestly, they really haven't made progress in terms of, in terms of uh, disclosure for uh, variable remuneration. Because at the end of the day, um, you've got two CEOs. Uh, each CEO is responsible for different divisions. So one CEO is responsible for the South African division, and the other CEO is responsible for divisions into Africa. And therefore, each CEO has got different key performance indicators. So what shareholders, or from my perspective, what I would have liked to have seen is, what are your key performance indicators? I cannot accept that the two CEOs get exactly the same bonus in the first year in which they, because it, it's different. And that's exactly what came out. Now, why did they come out? My opinion is that they didn't want to dissatisfy the one CEO with the other CEO. So are they sending a precedence into the future that they will always have the same bonuses? Barclays African Bank, I also engaged with Barclays African Bank before the AGM. And Brian Pretorius is the chairman of Remco. And in a way, the chairman of Barclays Africa, Remco, and the chairman of Standard Bank, Remco, are identical because they come up with exactly the same argument. Yes, we cannot disclose the key performance indicators. We have a group pool system, and this is how we, we, we our disclosure, and we think we, we've gone adequately enough. But at the end of the day, what is disclosed in these annual reports, ladies and gentlemen, is the CEO's salary. At the end of the day, what is disclosed is his variable bonus. What is disclosed is his long-term bonus. Now, if you've disclosed all that, the next question is, well, you've got a bonus. In the case of the CEO of Boxes Africa, Maria Ramos, I think she got something like 26 million. The prior year, I don't think she got anything. But at the end of the day, they disclosed that. So obviously, shareholders, being asset owners and asset managers, should want to know what is the makeup of that bonus? Now, in the, in the Zimbabwean context, and we will be looking at one uh, Zimbabwean co uh, company, which I attended the AGM of, um, in the Zimbabwean context, we don't have that disclosure. So the question is, how do asset owners and asset managers actually vote at AGMs on a resolution which is on the basis of, oh, we approve executive directors or non-executive director salaries, and they don't even give it. They don't even give a breakdown. So where's the engagement, ladies and gentlemen, from the asset owners and asset managers? I want to say one other thing. The bottom line is that you can have all the rules and regulations you want, but it's got to be here. Companies have got to raise their, their bar themselves. Companies in, this, in the Zimbabwean context have got to actually see what is happening in South Africa, what is happening in London, what is happening with the disclosures in, in America. And one of the biggest debates, oh, ladies and gentlemen, is the disparity between the CEO's salary and the lowest paid in that organization. And you know what? It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I was on CNBC. In fact, I'm just going off the speech here. I was on the CNBC um, TV, and, and, and we were talking about this disparity. And there was research done in America whereby in 1965, the ratio between the CEO and the lowest paid within the organization was 20 to 1. So let's say $200 to $1. 200 to the CEO, $1 to the lowest paid within the organization. In 2012, that ratio went up to 275 to 1. Now, how is that possible? Let me tell you why it is possible. It's possible because in the South African context, and it's a worldwide thing, unions have not actually done what they're supposed to do. Unions have not actually looked after their constituents. In the South African context, we have NUM and AMCU, and NUM, being the older union, hasn't actually driven the process of working harder for, for workers' rights. But which union has done well? The union which I call the Remuneration Committee. Now, who's made up of the Remuneration Committee, ladies and gentlemen? Normally, your members of the Remuneration Committee are from the board, and those members are normally ex-CEOs, ex-CFOs. And they've been very successful to ramp up the issue. And, and this is one of the logical conclusions which has happened in terms of disclosure, and it's something you must be aware of, um, in terms of disclosure of executive salaries. Once you disclose, then it sort of racks it up. Because you disclose the CEO's salary, and you disclose the CFO's salary, and then the middle management says, 
wow, my CEO is earning that and I'm quite close to that. And suddenly the whole thing racks up and it gets pushed up higher and higher and higher. So that's a negative. But I would rather have that negative and I'd rather have that in the public domain so that we can debate those issues. Here's a company, Caxton CTP Publishers. We have a principle, which is principle 2.27. It's a very simple principle. You've got to put forward your remuneration policy to the shareholders, okay? And by putting it forward once a year, it allows shareholders to debate the issue. Now, you're damned if you vote for it, and you're damned if you vote against it. And you should never abstain on a remuneration policy vote like Warren Buffett did in terms of Coca-Cola. The issue of remuneration policy is becoming more and more important in a South African context because what we're seeing here is simple. In terms of the principle, if you apply the principle, you just say you apply it. If you can't apply it, you say you don't apply it. But look how Caxton's applied the principle. And that's why I started off from the beginning of the speech that once you get a code, it's not the alpha and omega, ladies and gentlemen, because then what you need is you need people to work on those codes. Look at the last sentence there. Shareholders approve the non-executive director's remuneration by a special resolution at the annual general meeting each year. Big deal, but read the code. It says shareholders. The code basically is about approving a remuneration policy, not the actual payment. So they got it completely and utterly wrong. Then they said in acknowledgement to the issue that I raised, well, at least I got an acknowledgement. I'm thankful for that. But in acknowledgement to this, what they said to us is that, oh, well, we'll fix it up. And what do they mean by coming years? Will they fix it up next year, or the following year, or the following year? It's absolutely and utterly meaningless, coming years. You would think they'd fix it up straight away. Well, the JSE had something to say. Well, that's what I basically said. And the JSE said, they came up with this as in terms of the Companies Act. And they said, according to the JSE, has no authority to enforce the provisions of the Companies Act. But ladies and gentlemen, who does the JSE look after? I always say, and I've approached the JSC on, on more than one occasion in terms of certain issues which I needed to be addressed. And the JSC, ladies and gentlemen, my point of view is that the JSC is actually there to look after the people who invest in the JSC. So the JSC is not going to look after my interests, despite the fact that they think they're going to look after minority shareholders, but they're there to look after people who invest in the company. And therefore, they haven't addressed this issue. And in a way, I'm disappointed that they haven't addressed the issue because I think this is probably the only company that hasn't put forward its remuneration policy. It is an emotive issue. It is something which they should have addressed straight away, and they didn't. JD Group is a furniture producing company. And what they do is they sell furniture. And it's a bit like micro, micro lending as well. And, and a lot of people in the South African context can't afford to go along and buy furniture and can't put down the money to buy furniture. So what they have to do is they need to borrow money. And JD Group does that. They lend money to people to buy furniture, and they allow the people to pay it off. And the interest rates are unfortunately excessive. And on top of that, um, you know, South Africa's economy is not growing that great. And I mean, with the strikes in the platinum industry, what we're seeing is a lot of these people who have gone along and, and got debt and got into debt with JD Group, Ellerines, or African Bank are facing in garnishing orders. And garnishing orders are quite prohibitive in the sense that um, where you've taken a debt for 5,000 rands or 6,000 rands, once the garnish order lands on your doorstep, then you actually owe 20 or 30,000. So it's very prohibitive. I attended this AGM in November the 24th, and I asked a very simple question. I just said to him, well, are your provisions adequate in the light of the fact that African Bank, which owns Ellerines, actually had to increase their provisions? Um, it was a very basic question, and it was just based on a simple thing in the annual financial statements. Sometimes companies do give value, valuable information in annual financial statements, and the company did. And it's quite interesting to actually see it. If you look at it, it says, OK, that's your total exposure, and the bottom line is 9.7 billion. And just above that figure, arrears greater than five installments, but the last column total is 2.1 billion. That's quite huge. And ladies and gentlemen, I mean, if you can't make your first installment, yes, there could be a possibility that you'll come right in your second or third. But if you can't make the, the fifth installment, ladies and gentlemen, well then, I'm sure the auditors will also agree with me here, even though they didn't agree with me at the AGM, that you need to look at your provisions and you need to up your provisions. Well, my question was, do you have adequate provisions? And they quoted IFRS, and they said, yes, in terms of IFRS and in terms of our policy, everything's fine, Mr. Boerter. 
Well, it wasn't fine, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I'll come back to that slide. Three months later, JD Group comes out with a cautionary, and what do they say? They say, oh, we need to increase our provisions by 600 million. But just remember, when did I raise that question? I raised the question in November. So it was already five and a half months into the interim, ladies and gentlemen. Surely they could have been a little bit truthful with me to say that, hang on, maybe our provisions weren't adequate, or maybe we are going to be increasing our provisions. But at the end of the day, they didn't have enough provisions, and I, as an outside shareholder, and I do own one, one share in this company, actually held them to account in that. And that's, that, I'm sorry, is very wrong. But let's go back to the bonuses that they paid themselves. They paid themselves 10.5 million, which is not excessive. I think it's over four or five directors. However, if they had adequately provided, which at that time I said they were underprovided by 600 million, and they took my advice, but a little bit late, um, they wouldn't have got a bonus. That's why remuneration issues are so, so important. Zimbabwe does not or Zimbabwean uh, listed companies do not disclose bonuses or what the CEOs earn. So in my little journey with JD Group, ladies and gentlemen, I then sent an email to the company secretary and I said to him, please, can you send me your uh, minutes of the meeting? I just like to see, and I have engaged with Johan Peterson on more than one occasion in terms of what do I require for minutes. I don't require something which is verbatim of what has happened in the AGM. What I require is just the simple questions that were asked, and then it's just the answers of how you actually handle that. Because why do I need that, ladies and gentlemen? Because I need that to hold the company to account. And I need it for transparency's sake. Well, um, he then sent me this email to say that the minutes that he, which I'm gonna to reveal to you, and uh, whatever happens, happens, but the minutes that I, um, <coughs> The minutes that, I, um, that he's giving to me are confidential. Well, I read through the minutes, I think, four or five times, and I could see nothing confidential in the minutes, because, you know, most minutes of listed companies will be resolution so-and-so uh, was presented to the shareholders, it was passed by the shareholders, and that's that. And they'll go through all the resolutions, and then that is the minutes. Well, anyway, this is what he said. He says it's confidential, propriety rights, blah, 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 and this respects JD Group's reserves rights and whatever. Oh, well. So, these are the minutes now, and that's the quote from the minutes in terms of the questions I asked. He says, following questions by one of the shareholding dealing... I mean, he doesn't even give me recognition that Theo Buda asked the questions, but, I mean, that could have gone a long way to me just actually not saying anything. But doesn't even do that. So these are the questions. I asked about director's resignations. I asked about the level of company margins and profits and the level of impairments and adequacy of provisions. But that was a critical question. And on top of that, ladies and gentlemen, the press were at the AGM. So I don't know what other thing was confidential, but they reported on that AGM. And for the year end of this and director's report, which questions were answered? Now, this is what I really love. I mean, we, they answered the questions. But come on, ladies and gentlemen, how did you answer the questions? So that was JD Group. And we move on, ladies and gentlemen, to something which, which is really quite a big issue in, in the South African context, and that's construction cartels. I don't know if you have a competition commission here in uh, Zimbabwe, but we've got quite an aggressive competition commission. And all these companies, Aving, Wilson Bailey, Basil Reed, Murray Robbs, Group 5, Stephen Oti, some of these companies are actually on your doorstep, building roads for you, ladies and gentlemen. They were all held to account for not price fixing, they call it price transferring. It's amazing how they come up with new words when they've been caught out for an illegal activity. What is also amazing, ladies and gentlemen, is there's never any accountability. So I actually have an analogy which is quite simple. I say that in terms of somebody who hasn't adhered to cartel behavior, it's a bit like a taxi driver driving through a red robot and there's a big accident and people get killed. So the taxi driver pays the fine to the government. He's gone through a red light, he admits guilt and he pays it. But the family that have suffered bereavement and, and the members who have been in the taxi and that have suffered um, disabilities and whatever, they must now go and fight their case to try and get their money. And that's what happens. Every one of these, except for Group 5, they haven't settled with the Competition Commission. Every one of those barring Group 5 have settled with the competition and paid a fine. 500 to 600 rand, 600 million, whatever they've paid. 
But at the end of the day, stakeholders, and the stakeholders are huge, it's government, it's universities, it's construction companies, we had the World Cup four years ago. All of, the, all of these people, these stakeholders have lost money. So Wilson Bailey Homes, I mean this is quite interesting in terms of, sometimes there's snippets in annual financial statements which are quite exciting to read. And basically here it says here, long serving directors and staff involved in Wilson Bailey Homes internal inquiries should not have formed part of the team to identify collusive behavior. They should have appointed an independent body. So, I mean, they, they're investigating themselves. So they said, well, the long-serving members who were part of this whole issue of anti-competitive behavior, they're the ones who actually are formed part of the committee. I mean, what's the use of that? Eh? And then also, what well, companies, listen, companies say, oh, well, let's put it behind us. You know, that's a bad blitz that we've gone through. Let's just leave this issue and let's move on, ladies and gentlemen. But you know what? You, you can't move on because the damage that has been done to society is serious and nobody wants to quantify it. Sassel, I call them a serial offender because they've been caught out three times in terms of uh, cartel behavior and um, they're international in terms of doing that. They've got the fertilizer cartel, the wax cartel and now the latest one is the propylene and polypropylene cartel. But look at the huge fine on the last one, 534 million penalty on a subsidiary of Cecil for overcharging local customers. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to ask yourself, yes, I've paid the fine, now what are we going to do about if there's a class action? We don't have class action per se. And because it's such a big company, how does an individual come along and say, look, I need to claim? Fertilizer is a prime example. What does fertilizer actually do? Fertilizer, we use fertilizer, it goes to the farmer, the farmer plants the crop. So if he's paying a little bit more for his fertilizer, that has a knock-on effect on wheat and on maize. So actually it's got a knock-on effect on the poorest of the poor. Do you know what? I actually approached Sassel, I went to go see them with the PIC, and I said to them, guys, you know what, you need to do good. You need to, you need to actually put back some of the money, that you, the super profits that you've derived, back into society and either put it back into the university or put it back into something. So there we see there a 52 million civil claim and look how they're defending it. They get an economist because they say, you know, it's very difficult for us to work out our super profits that we made. You know, we need economists, we need to go through every single transaction. So they put checks and balances in place. I don't know what they paid for the fertilizer thing. I think it must have been in the region of 300 to 400 million. So why can't they pay 300 to 400 million to civil society? Why do companies do this? And this is where the asset owners and asset managers should be driving the role. If I was the CEO of the PIC, I promise you they would pay the money. Because I insist that they pay the money. I would drive the process and they would pay money back to civil society in one form or another. But I'm not the CEO. Ladies and gentlemen, I had a um, wonderful experience of attending one of your companies in Zimbabwe, in school. And I mean, these are the questions. They're general questions. They're questions which I would ask any other listed company. But now, the issue is, the first question I would ask now, and I, hopefully I will be in a position to attend the AGM again, but the first question which I would ask in school now is, can you give me your minutes? Because I would like to see how they encompass all these questions which I've asked in minutes. Then once you get the minutes, then you say, okay, and it's to the benefit of all shareholders this. All the big shareholders will benefit from this. But this is what the big shareholders should be doing. We shouldn't be relying on codes, ladies and gentlemen, and hope that these codes, uh, our codes for corporate governance is going to be everything. Because what the company is going to do, they're going to get the codes and just tick it as a tick box. Tick, tick, tick. And no disrespect to the auditors. Um, but, but the auditors have done very well out of our King 3 code in terms of that. Because what the companies have said is they've said, OK, right, hang on. We've, we've gone to the code. We're quite happy with our 76 principles. Can we get our auditors in just to go through the process to see whether we've applied it and whether we've explained it? So actually, sometimes it ups the costs within the company. So we, we can see the, the flaws in terms of this. Why must, like a very basic question is, is that, you know, do you have a remuneration policy in place? Shucks, if I was an owner, an asset owner or an asset manager of this company, I would, I would hope that they experience in the sense that they see what, what's happening in the South African context and say to myself, do you have a policy? 
we, we approved fees here somewhere. Independent, non-executive fees increased by 93%, and non-independent fees decreased. Could you please explain? So, I mean, fees go up, but what you want to see is where have the fees gone up? You've got some sort of consultancy fees here. You've got fees which are uh, basic salary increases to the CEOs. What do they get? You know, and, and that's a very important thing, especially in the light of what we've seen in South Africa. The directors aren't getting huge salary increases. They're very much keeping their salaries down. But where they are getting huge increases, they're working on their performance bonuses to get there. But can you see the floor that you're sitting in? I mean, this is one company. I think this is probably a very well-run company. It's a food company. I'm very positive about food companies. Um, but, but that's one company. What about other companies? What about other companies who probably don't have, let's say, a, as good as governance principles that Enscore's got? And maybe they're just below the radar screen. What are they getting away with, ladies and gentlemen? And this is what the press said, based on my own blah, 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 blah. Okay, so let's get back to this. Does Zimbabwe have a set of good governance principles? Does Zimbabwe have a code for responsible investment? Well, you don't have it, and we've discussed that issues. And you're in the process of putting something together, which is fantastic. But I just want to warn you that when you do get it, it's not the alpha and the omega. What you need is, once you got it, is something to drive that process. That's what you need, and that's critical. So, and who would do the process? Your asset owners and asset managers need to drive the process. So, I mean, to finalize, what I feel is that maybe what you need is...